Hello, I'm Marites Vito. Welcome to Southeast Asia Speaks. This is a show where I get to interview resource persons and newsmakers on issues affecting the region. I will be speaking to Simon Chesterman, Dean and Professor of the National University of Singapore Faculty of Law. We will be talking about the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index for 2021, focusing on Southeast Asia. Professor Chesterman joins us from Singapore. Thank you, Simon, for making time for this interview. We're very happy to have you. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much. Yes, so now there was this recently launched World Justice Project Rule of Law Index. And maybe just briefly for our audience, can you walk us through the factors that the, the Rule of Law Index uh, considers in ranking countries according to uh, their uh, criteria? Yeah, sure. So, so the rule of law, basically everyone around the world agrees with it, uh, but sometimes it's a bit hard to define in practice. Uh, and so what the World Justice Project has been doing for a decade is actually surveying people, trying to work out their experience of the rule of law. And so every year now, the World Justice Project engages in a, in a survey that involves more than 100,000 people in countries all over the planet. Uh, and we're getting their sense of basically whether the rule of law delivers in terms of um, accountability, just laws, open government, uh, and if there are accessible and impartial institutions to protect their rights and obligations. And so the, the survey offers a snapshot based on people's actual experience of the rule of law in practice. Uh, and that over time gives us an opportunity to measure how things have been changing, how things have been developing, and hopefully how we can all improve in our uh, embrace of the rule of law, both in theory, but especially in practice. So does this mean that if a country ranks high in the rule of law index, we can call it like a vibrant, a stable democracy? Not necessarily. Uh, in the past, I think many people did think that democracy and rule of law went hand in hand. Uh, but I think over the past 20 or so years, uh, we've seen that they don't necessarily have to go directly hand in hand. I think certainly strong elections can reinforce the rule of law. The basic idea of a social contract is that people give to their government um, certain powers to raise taxes, to run police forces and so on, in exchange for the legitimacy that is reinforced through elections. And those things can reinforce each other. Uh, but I think it is possible for the rule of law to operate even without sort of a lockstep development of democracy. What I would say is rather than necessarily suggesting a vibrant democracy, a strong showing in the rule of law means that people feel safe, that they trust their public institutions, and they think that their rights are going to be respected. So that will often coincide with a democracy, but it doesn't necessarily have to go hand in hand. Yes. Uh, in the <clears throat> In the 2021 Rule of Law Index, we've seen that the eight countries surveyed in Southeast Asia, they've all declined in terms of the ranking. So what is common among these eight Southeast Asian countries? Or was it the pandemic? Maybe you can uh, walk us through the factors which contributed to the decline here in Southeast Asia. Yeah, well, the first thing to say is this isn't unique to Southeast Asia. Uh, some people have framed this as a rule of law recession around the world. Uh, and so I think certainly the pandemic has exacerbated rule of law challenges. And that's natural when, when there's an emergency, when governments are really straining, uh, and in particular when, as we've seen in the pandemic, uh, the, the public good sometimes runs up against individual rights. I think it is understandable that individuals start to feel a little more wary about institutions, a little more shaky in terms of the protection of their own rights. Uh, but number one, this isn't limited to Southeast Asia. Uh, and number two, apart from the pandemic, uh, I think there were already suggestions in the works uh, of a move, sort of a challenge to our assumption that the rule of law would continue to improve. The kind of populist movements that we've seen in places like well, the United States, but also Hungary and elsewhere, Southeast Asia hasn't been immune from that. Uh, and so I think that's one of the reasons why public perception of the rule of law has declined here as it has elsewhere. Uh, exacerbated by the pandemic, but not solely due to the pandemic. Yes, and in Southeast Asia, it's quite interesting that Singapore ranks the highest uh, in the uh, rule of law index. What is it about Singapore that always puts it at the top? 
like where people feel safe, there is order. Is it the political culture? Is it the leadership? Uh, I'm just trying, we're just trying to understand, you know, the culture in, in Singapore that always makes it rank among the highest in terms of rule of law. Well, obviously, as dean of a law school in Singapore, <laughs> I, have, I have a vested interest in this. Um, but I think it is, it is telling that um, uh, around the world, if there's one word that most people would associate with Singapore, uh, it could well be law. Um, sometimes in a negative sense, some of the laws here are quite strict, uh, but often in a positive sense that Singapore has really focused with laser-like precision on a zero tolerance for corruption uh, and a strict maintenance of the rule of law, um, a lot of investment in law and institutions. Um, our, our judges are very high quality. Uh, and so I think it's a combination of that prioritization of the government, but candidly, it's also helped a little bit by the small size and relative wealth of Singapore. I think it's a lot easier to make those investments and to get that buy-in when you're smaller, uh, when you, you have more resources to deploy uh, so that um, you, can, you can make those investments. But certainly it's been extremely important to Singapore's uh, development over time. I mean, the way I describe this is that um, legal services is important in Singapore, but it makes up about 0.5, 0.6% of GDP in the area of legal services. But legal services and the strong embrace of the rule of law underpins everything else, especially things like financial services. Uh, and so you won't have, it, well, it's very hard to have a strong banking sector, a strong financial sector, if there isn't strong rule of law going along with it. Uh, so I think in Singapore, we really have embraced that. Uh, and it's, it's something that no one in government would question, that the importance of rule of law to Singapore is among the very top priorities for the government. And I think it's also in the telling that the Asia Pacific office or bureau or hub of the World Justice Project is in Singapore. And uh, that's, that speaks well of Singapore. Now, again, in the ranking, Malaysia comes next to, to Singapore. But of course, we know that there is uh, political uh, uncertainty in Malaysia yet it's considered to be second to Singapore, at least among the eight countries in Southeast Asia. Your thoughts on this, Simon? So rule, rule of law, in particular, the way it's measured in the World Justice uh, Projects um, Index is, is really about perception. And so I think political instability, the fact that there are changes of government, provided those changes of government are done in accordance with the law, um, political instability doesn't mean rule of law instability. Uh, and I think Malaysia has uh, a long tradition of political infighting, uh, as many countries do. Uh, but overall, it's been, for the most part, stable. Uh, and most of the citizens, I think, uh, believe, or at least this is what the survey demonstrates, uh, believe that uh, there's still accountability, that their rights are going to be protected and so on, um, that they, there is not uh, excessive corruption and things like that. Uh, so I think the fact that there are political changes uh, changes of government, you don't need the degree of stability, for example, that we have in Singapore in order to maintain a high uh, embrace of the rule of law. And maybe Malaysia is a good example of that. Also, another uh, finding in the rule of law index is that uh, Indonesia has ranked higher than the Philippines in the past. Well, we always used to be compared. Philippines and Indonesia are always compared to each other. But now the distinction of having the stable democracy in Southeast Asia belongs to Indonesia. Again, your thoughts on this, because um, we're trying also to understand where Indonesia, how Indonesia has improved under Jokowi. Right, well, again, the, the index measures public perception. So this is a survey of households, of experts. Uh, and so I'm a little bit wary about comparing two countries and saying, well, one's going up at the expense of the other. This is just the perception in each country and you can compare them, but I wouldn't regard it a bit like, it's not like there's a bidding war uh, and one is outbidding the other. So within Indonesia, I do think actually um, uh, constitutional changes of government, elections that lead to results that are respected, those can certainly reinforce perceptions of the rule of law. Uh, and Indonesia, even notwithstanding the pandemic, um, I think, uh, the, the public perception that broadly they're going in the right direction. Uh, Indonesia, of course, is a, is a very large country uh, with, with a thriving economy. Um, they've been exporting. Um, some of their companies have uh, gone global. Uh, and I think that also generally uh, contributes to a perception of, uh, if not success, then at least going in the direction of success. Uh, 
Uh, so I think that's one of the things that's going on. Uh, the fact that uh, Jokowi, as he's known, is, is reasonably popular, that also helps. If people are satisfied with their lives, if they're confident about the future, uh, and if they believe, again, that their rights are going to be respected, that translates well, in, at least in terms of a rule of law index. Yes, again, another interesting uh, finding is that Vietnam and Thailand are almost, well, not on the same level, but uh, not, not far from each other. And Thailand, as we know, is ruled by the generals and Vietnam is a one party state. So make the perception also has to do with the kind of government. Uh, you said you don't want to compare, but at least your thoughts on these two, two countries. Yeah, so so as I said earlier, the rule of law doesn't depend on democracy. I think it is reinforced by democracy. I think democracy will really strengthen perceptions of the rule of law. Uh, but in the absence of a formal democracy, it's still possible to have rule by law or even rule of law in a kind of more limited, narrow way. Uh, so as you said, Thailand has, uh, has had uh, an atypical political structure. Vietnam uh, is not by any stretch a liberal democracy. Uh, but I think one of the things that the rule of law index measures is, if not democracy, then at least good government. Um, and in some situations, even in the absence of free and fair elections, um, if there is a perception that government, even if it's not traditional democracy, is at least functioning well, if it's delivering on its uh, on its promises to the people, uh, then there is a degree of tolerance for that. Uh, and again, that translates well in terms of the rule of law index. So to the extent that these countries are stable, delivering security, basic welfare, and the possibility of economic development to their populations, then that can lead to a perception at least that uh, the country isn't going in the wrong direction, even if it's not necessarily uh, ranking at the top of the rule of law perception index. Yes, of course, uh, we know that in the Philippines, we also have declined, well, you said it's not unique to Southeast Asia, but the indicators you mentioned that the Philippines has also declined in those aspects. And maybe to the last two countries, the Myanmar and Cambodia consistently have been in the lower ranking of the rule of law index in, in Southeast Asia. But this has been going on for some time. And again, can we attribute this to their the system of government there? As we know, of course, Myanmar has had a coup recently and Cambodia has been ruled by a dictator, an authoritarian leader for a long time. So are these the main mainstays for their uh, low ranking in the rule of law index? So rule of law, I mean, the way we define rule of law uh, for the purposes of the index, as I said, it's this, it's this survey of people to the extent to which they believe uh, there is accountability, just laws, open government, and so on. Sometimes it's easier to define rule of law in comparison with other uh, attitudes towards law. Uh, and so at one extreme, if you like, is rule of man. Uh, and that was the kind of feudal rule, that's the absolute monarch whose word is law. And there are very few countries like that. There are a handful though, and maybe Myanmar and Cambodia are in this category, where it's rule by law, that you have um, a system of laws, but they don't really apply to those who are making decisions. Um, so power is organized. It's not completely arbitrary. It's not just the whim of a, of a crazy ruler. Um, but it would be a stretch to argue that the law applies to the governing in the same way that it applies to the governed. Uh, and that might be what we're seeing in places like Myanmar and Cambodia, uh, where I suspect the majority of the population don't really feel that they can hold the government uh, such as it is to account in the way that you could, for example, in a democracy, but even in a non-traditional democracy where there are functioning institutions. Um, so that, that's the sort of political analysis. There is also an economic analysis that um, insofar as a country uh, is, uh, has uh, weaker institutions, less ability to um, affect its rule across the territory uh, and greater instability, and we've seen that most obviously in Myanmar over the past couple of decades actually, uh, then, then I think that also undermines the perceptions of the rule of law. I mean, Myanmar, you, you mentioned it's, um, it's had an unconstitutional change of government recently, uh, but it's had um, serious armed insurgencies in many parts of the country for decades now. Uh, and that makes it uh, all the more likely when people are surveyed and asked about stability, accountability, uh, for them to be wary about the extent to which the laws can be enforced uh, or even understood in many parts of the country. Okay, the final question, Simon, let's maybe step back a bit. 
as you said earlier, Southeast Asia is not unique. There's been a decline in rule of law in many parts of the world. So that's and also relative uh, similarly in the Freedom House uh, 2021 report, there's also been a decline in democracy in many parts of the world. So rule of law, as you said, and democracy, they go hand in hand, but it's not necessarily um it has to be reinforced rather by one by democracy. So what's the big takeaway from this? Uh, rule of law index for 2021? So the big takeaway for me is um, that the rule of law is like oxygen. It's easy to take for granted, but you notice it very quickly when it when it disappears. Uh, and I think uh, for a long time, we have taken the rule of law for granted. Uh, I think many Western commentators in particular, I think believed after the end of the Cold War in the 1990s, assumed that there would be this inevitable push towards liberal democracy and rule of law around the world. We had people talking about the end of history and so on. Uh, and I think a lot of that was misguided. So I think this is a wake up call, if you like, uh, this 2021 index. It's a wake up call to remind us not to take the, the rule of law for granted, not to take the kind of inevitable progression of human history towards greater justice, greater fairness for granted. But the rule of law isn't like oxygen. It's something we have to work at, something we have to fight for. Uh, and something we have to value. Otherwise, we'll only notice it when it's gone. Okay, wow. Thank you for that uh, big takeaway. And, and also, I think for those listening and for the viewers, there's a lot of work to do, at least in the Philippines, um, to work to strengthen the rule of law here. Now, I mean, it's not just government. It's the civil society. It's the journalists. It's the communities working together to strengthen the rule of law. So on that note, thank you very much, Professor Chesterman. And we hope to continue this conversation on in the future on a similar subject. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us and keeping us company. Bye. Bye.